Hi, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar. Uh, I'm Erin. I'm kind of your resident webinar host here at Softry. Uh, with me is my colleague, Matthew Dickey, who happens to also be our training manager. So today is a little bit different than our usual webinars. Uh, this is actually an introductory training webinar where we are going to give you, hi, Matt, uh, we are going to actually give you all the files that we're demonstrating here today and let you practice with them after. So our goal really is to introduce you to the core concepts and workflows in Rodent, whether that's Rodent Forest Engineer or Rodent Civil Engineer, uh, basically two different, slightly different install versions of the same software, uh, as it would be used for a rural road design project. So I've got just a very short introduction, uh, and then I'm going to pass it over to Matt, and we're going to get into the content. So our starting point in pretty much every project uh, is the import of survey data. And in this training session, we are going to show you how to import two main types of data. Uh, we are going to demonstrate how to import both LiDAR data as well as conventional data, for example, RTK. And from there, we're going to create a TIN model with contours, save the file, and move on into the location module, which is where our project goal uh, is achieved. So today we're going to be demonstrating a road realignment project. We're going to show you how to set up your road design project, including updating your cross-section template, uh, creating a horizontal and a vertical alignment, adding curves to them. We're going to demonstrate how to balance your mass haul and calculate your cut and fill quantities. We're going to also show you how to add in some simple culverts or cross drains uh, to that project. And then the final kind of core step in the workflow is creating an output. So we'll demonstrate how to create construction documentation using our multi-plot uh, report builder, as well as some different other output formats that you can communicate your road design. Now, as I mentioned, this is a training webinar. We are going to be sending you in your follow-up email from today's seminar a link to all of the files used here today, as well as this video for replicating the steps at your own speed. If you are watching this video in the future on YouTube, please check out the links in the video description below uh, for the example files. And if you don't have access to the software yet, uh, there'll be a link in that video description as well for a trial. Uh, and with that, Matt, I think it's over to you. Alrighty. Well, thanks for the introduction, Erin, and I will share my screen. Yes, and I think and we're going to we'll... drop off our cameras that you can focus yep. on seeing the software. So it was nice to meet everybody uh, and enjoy today's webinar. All right. So we're in business. And we'll run through the process for a, a fairly straightforward realignment project. Um, and we aren't going to go into a ton of detail for kind of all the features in the software, but we're going to hopefully cover the, the foundational concepts. So to start, we're going to open up the train module, and we are going to bring in our survey information into that. So we'll click the train icon, and I'll click insert file, go to the file with my survey data, and to start, I'm going to bring in conventional data. So as Aaron said in the intro, we're going to bring in two different data sets. One's going to be LiDAR data, and one's going to be conventional survey data. Um, so oftentimes, folks will use either or. Uh, you can use either or, you can combine them together. We're going to just look at importing both, but we're going to continue on with our example with LiDAR data. Uh, so I'm going to bring in this CSV file. So this CSV file, if we open it up, it's pretty normal format. We've got our point number, coordinates, and point code. So we'll click open. And on my import options, I could go with this ASCII text option and import it. Now if I did that, that's our default settings. And we could either go with the def default settings, or we could set up a import option that helps automate how it connects the dots for us. Now, I've already done that, so I've got an IOP file that I'm going to read in. So in select options, I've clicked new format. I'm going to click merge. 
and I'm going to add in this webinar example IOP. So we'll get a bunch of prompts here where it's not going to overwrite the import options that we already have, but we can see I've brought in MD survey. And I can add it to the list. We'll select that. And now in our import options, I've got my X coordinate set up to be what my uh, the second column. I've got my Y coordinate set up to be the third column. Z coordinate set up to be the fourth column. And my point codes are defined as the fifth column. So this is where we can set this up if we'd like, but we've already done that in this case. And then in the codes, I've set up my point codes to automatically connect the dots for me for my centerline shots, for my uh, road edge shots, whereas my ground shots are just a single point. So really easy to bring that in. One thing we will do here is set our projection. So I'm setting mine based off an EPSG code. This project's in New Zealand. And we'll hit OK. So we've got that brought in. We can see our ground shots. We can see all our line work is connected as it should be. So we can also click the 3D view and see that in 3D. But in the 3D view, it becomes very obvious that we don't have a surface. So to create, take that information and turn it into a surface, we're going to go up to the top, click Terrain Modeling, click Generate, and we are going to generate our tin, and we are also going to generate contours. So I've got my contours set to be in five meter intervals for my major contours and one meter intervals for my minor. I'll hit OK. And there's our surface data. So if we were using this file for our design, I could hit save and we could continue the process uh, with this surface. Let's use the LiDAR data instead. So we're going to open up another instance of terrain. We'll click insert file. And here our LiDAR data is in an LAZ format. We'll click open. We can see the import options are a little different. It's given the different format. It's classified data, so we want to use the ground points, which matches our default settings. That LAZ file carries our projection, so we don't have to worry about setting the projection. And we'll hit OK. So now we're getting a big magenta blob being drawn on our screen. So these are all the individual LiDAR points that were shot when the, the area was scanned. Now each one of these individual points doesn't offer a lot of information. It's not very useful just to look at it and see this cloud of points. So the property for those points is for whether it's displayed or not, it's turned off. Now we've just inserted it. So all of our points that we've just inserted are currently selected. But once we click away and deselect the selected features, it appears they disappear. But we can see down here we still have 2.7 million points. So let's take that information and we'll turn that into a surface just as we did with the RTK data. So we'll click Terrain Modeling. We'll click Generate. We can set our contours to be whatever we'd like. I'll go 25 and 5 in this case. We'll hit OK. And it's going to take a moment to generate the tin surface and another few moments to generate the contours. So we're going from having less than 2,000 points to more than 2 million points. It makes sense that the process time is a bit larger. And there we are. There's our contours. Now we can just click the 3D view. It'll take a moment to render that, and we can get a real feel for what we're dealing with on this project. We can hit File, Save As. I'm going to save this as my topo.trx. So we could jump right into location right now and start designing from this surface. I'm going to do one more thing that is entirely optional in terrain. Um, and that is I want to add a little more context for what I have going on. So I could do that by adding in uh, various line work. It could be DWG, DXF, shapefile, etc. Or I could add in an image. So I could add in my own image, or in this case, I'm not going to use my own image. I'm going to click Home, click Import, click Live Maps, 
and I'm going to bring in an image from a web map tile service. So in this case, I'll use Google. I'll hit save. That's going to download that image to my desktop. So I'll hit that. I'm just going to save this in the same location. We'll hit OK. And there we are. Now that image that we've just downloaded, we can't just click it and select it. It's actually added in as a background, which is its own separate terrain file referenced into this one. So let's switch gears out of the terrain module and we'll jump into location. And locations where we are going to tackle our linear infrastructure design. So I'm going to click this little green icon. I'm going to set up a new file. So just I'll emphasize one thing here. Location is a different format than terrain. So we are going to click new file rather than open. So we're creating a new location file and then here we reference the terrain file that we've just created with our topo data. So we'll hit that, we'll click open and we'll hit OK. Now in this case I'm going to just use a single point for my initial alignment. So I'm starting with a dot and I'm going to draw in my alignment by hand. If we had an alignment that was a train feature or a land XML file or a traverse we could reference those alignments in here to use as a, a starting alignment. We'll just go with a single point. We'll click next, we'll click done and we'll hit OK. Now here, starting out, I can see my plan view. I can see I've got two panels off to the side here. I've got a data table and my section window. And if I want to see something like uh, my culvert editor, I can click this little icon here. It pops up in my panel. If I want to see my profile, I can click that little button there. Now here it's personal preference, but I have a screen layout that I like to use when I'm designing and most people that use the software a lot develop personal preference. So I like my profile over here, my plan view over here, and my panels all set up beforehand. So I could move these around wherever I'd like. Once I was happy with them, I could click view. And then in the screen layout, I could click save. And if I save over my normal .dlt, my default settings are overwritten and that'll be what opens up when I open the software. Now my normal reflects the install default right now, but I'm going to switch over to my personal preference, which I've saved in here. I'll click that. Oh, whoops. I need to retrieve it rather than save it. So retrieve, webinar, screen layout, open. And there we are. So my plans over here, profiles over here, 3Ds here, and I've got a few other uh, panels available to me than what is visible when I first open the software. I'm going to do a couple more things just to make things pretty and the way I like to see them. So in my plan view, I want to add that image that we've downloaded. So I'm going to right-click in my plan view. I'm going to go down to plan options. I've got my background here. It's turned on, but I'm going to click the plus next to it. I'm going to click add, and I'm going to navigate to that image file that we've just downloaded when we were in terrain. So I'll click open. That gets brought into the list here. There's a draw order here, though. And since that's an image, I don't want it to be drawn over top of my contours. So I'm going to shift that up. So with the image.trx selected, I'm going to click shift up. And then I'm going to click, click OK. I'll 
hit OK. And there we are. We've got a little more context for what we're dealing with. Next, I have my 3D view. So we didn't have to do that background uh, exercise, but it's nice to know where things are at. We don't have to set up our 3D view, but it's nice to see everything change in real time as we design. So I'm going to right click here, click 3D options. I'm going to click Train Surfaces and click Add, and I'm going to add in a corridor surface. So I'll click OK. Now my options here are the source. So I've got one alignment in my design so far, and in this case it's just a single point so far. But horizontal alignment one. And I want to use the final merged surface from it. So with that, if I wanted to just show my subgrade, I could select just my subgrade. If I wanted to show surface uh, one, I could show surface one. The final merge surface is that total final uh, road top. So your pavement, your shoulder, and your subgrade all together. I'm going to change my color so it's something that contrasts from the uh, topo surface. I'm going to set my topo surface to be gray. I'll hit OK. So we've got that. My topo, I'm going to turn that on so I can see the surface. So display triangles, shade triangles. Since I can see the surface, I don't really care to see contours, and that's the only thing I have in that file. So I'm going to turn display features off. But one thing that I am going to do here that might not be overly intuitive is I'm going to click the plus, and I'm going to change my alpha channel. So the alpha channel, if you're not familiar with the terminology, it controls the transparency of that surface. So 255 is fully opaque. You can't see it. You won't be able to see your road if your road was all cut. Um, zero is fully transparent, so it won't show any surface. I want to be somewhere in between the two. We'll hit OK. And there we are. So we've got what we want to see as we design uh, showing. The next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to make sure my cross-section geometry is reasonable uh, for my project needs. So we can see our cross-section geometry in the section view, but where this geometry is created is in the template editor. So I'm going to click this. And we can see here that we've got three templates. So these three templates are the templates that come when you install the software. I've got the civil install, so my uh, default is this rural roadway. So we've got a paved surface with our base and sub-base material as well as the subgrade. If you had the resource version of the software, your default would be a gravel road. So these templates, if we just click right click and click the properties, there's not a lot of variables in the templates themselves to change. We can change our super elevation, we can tell it whether to override the super elevation with curve super if we're in curves, whether it calculates volumes for us. But the bulk of the information that we can adjust here is in the components. So if we expand this we can see we have several components making up this template. So we have a rural one component, so that's our roadway. Then we have our ditch one component, that's our ditch. And that ditch appears there if we're in cut, but if we're in fill, it's not being generated for us. So there's some logic in there. And then we have our slopes component. Now we can double click any of these, or we can just select what we like and click properties. Or we can right click and click properties, and we can tabularly change all the variables that make up that geometry. So for example, if I wanted to change my fill slope for my uh, base material, I can select that variable. I can see it gets highlighted in magenta right here. I can click the drop down and I can change that to whatever slope I'd like. And if it was something obscure, not a normal ratio, I could say, well, let's make that 
Now let's set that at four to one. I want to do the same as my uh, that. I'll go four to one. And my ditch, I'm going to change this as well. Now with this, I just pulled this around to look at it in a, a different situation. So I can move this around and test that cross-section geometry without affecting my design. This is just a sandbox where we can play and make sure things behave the way we'd like. So I've got my left road configured the way I'd like. I could do the same for our right side, or I can just delete it and copy that side in and paste it as our right. And there is a construction order here. So if I had that at the bottom, these other template components would be drawn first, which I don't want. So we'll keep the construction order sequenced appropriately. We'll do the same for our ditch. And there we are. So that behaves the way I'd like it to and has the geometry I'd like it to. So I'm happy with that. Now, another quick tangent. If I had, or if I wanted geometry that's very different from the geometries that I have access to in my default templates, I could click this eLibrary button. I could select these various components. I could click OK. And we could expand these and say, well, maybe I don't want a rural left component. Maybe I wanted to build a, a mine road, for example, where I've just got a gravel surface with up to two surfacing layers. But if I'm in a fill situation where I have a drop over a certain height, say three meters, we can shift that up and that berm, safety berm gets added automatically for us. So we could copy that in and paste it into the template that we'd like and away we go. We'll just use this default template for this example. So I'll hit OK. Since I've changed the default template and that's what I have applied, that gets changed in our section view. If we change something other than the template that was applied, we could go into our assigned by range parameters and say, use this other template from station X to station Y. And we could have different templates throughout our design. So we are going to use that rural template from start to end. So I don't need to know the station that it's going to end. I've just got dot, 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 dot in there. And then I'm going to start figuring out my geometry. Or my alignment, I should say. Cross section is part of the geometry. So I'm going to start by figuring out my horizontal alignment. And this is going to be an iterative process. I'm going to start with my horizontal, then I'm going to adjust my profile, and then I'm going to adjust my horizontal again until I narrow in on something that I'd like. But we'll start here. So I've right-clicked in my plan view. I've clicked Add Edit IP Tool. I'm going to go within the snapping tolerance of that little dot there. So the cursor changes from a pencil to a square. I click once to unanchor it. I'm going to zoom in to where I'd like to start my road. So I've just zoomed in with the wheelie on my mouse. I click once to anchor that down. So we can see where we're starting. And now, as I click along our alignment, everything's updating in real time. So I'm going to go way out there. So I'm just thinking of this in terms of straight lines to start. Maybe I go there, maybe I go, well, I want to tie in right before that crossing. And of course, I want to match the existing alignment a bit, at least try to. So I'm going to pull that around. So we can see the topo surface underneath what I've drawn in. And before I start designing my profile or vertical alignment, I'm going to add in some vertical curves. Because of course, that's going to influence the position of our road, grades, etc. So 
I go to my horizontal curves panel. I can choose what type of curve I'd like to apply, whether that's a spiral curve or a circular curve. I'll go with spiral curve to start. And I'll hit apply. And there we are. So we've got our transitions, we've got the curve itself, and away we go. Now if I'm happy with that, great. If I'm not happy with that, I can click Add Edit IP Tool. I can pull this around and move it anywhere I'd like. If I start to do that and decide, well, I don't want to move that after all, I can hit Escape, and then Yes. And if I want to change the radius, of that I can as well. So I'll hit my radius of 130. Actually I'll start with 150. Well maybe I want to go with whatever my design class minimum is. So I'll check that button. It tells me I can go as low as 130 and still be within my design parameters. And there we are. And if we look at this in a little bit more detail here we can see that that curve is super elevated for us. So, our curve is set, super elevation is set based off of a table. Those tables are based off of ASHTO standards, but if you wanted to, you can hit select table and you could modify that table um, and have it reflect a different design standard if you'd like. We can do that for other things, transition lengths, et cetera, et cetera. So, it'd be very easy. So we've got our first curve in. I'm going to just click the next button, jump to this next IP. I'm going to add a curve there. I want it to be the smallest curve I can get away with. So I've turned that checkbox on. And in this case, I want to crowd that ending point as much as I can. So I'm going to grab this and pull this all the way to the end. we are. Next I'm going to start my vertical alignment. So it's very similar. I'm going to right click Add Edit IP in my profile. My starting point is where I'd like it to be. I'm going to just click along here and say well I probably want to have some kind of curve start there. We'll come up here, and as we do this, everything's being calculated in real time. So I can see if I click at that point, I'm in fill. Makes sense, I'm in fill there. And if I look at my 3D view, I'm in fill there. And I can come in here and let's tie into this existing grade. So we'll pull this up. And I can see down here, this graph is tracking me my, my surplus and deficits. So this is my mass haul diagram. So I can see that for the start, I'm cutting way more material than I'm filling. And it makes sense, I've got a lot of cut. So up until that point, I'm generating more material. And then after this point here, I start to lose that material. And I zero out right around that point. So let's add vertical curves in. So I'll set my K value. So I'll go with a K value of 20. I'll jump back here. I'm going to add a parabolic curve here as well. Instead of defining this based off the K value though, that's a fairly short curve, 26.8 meters long. I'm going to change this and say, well, I want it to be 60 meters long. So it solves for the K value to get me that. And I'll just mention it. If I wanted to, I could set that to auto. And this is going to calculate the site distance that I want to work with and give me my minimum K value to adhere to my site requirements. So those site requirements are defined based off reaction time vehicle acceleration, etc. So these parameters there. But 
let's we don't want the minimums here we can go a lot larger than the minimum so we've got that in there and now I'll start to try to fine tune it so I'm going to I want this to balance. I also want to minimize my cuts and fills as much as I can. So I'm going to add in a couple more IPs. Try and get this spike to be lower and get this close to the zero line at the end. Having that finish at zero is going to be our, our balanced design. And I'm pretty happy with my horizontal in this case. There's not really a lot of adjustments to make, um, but oftentimes this this will be an iterative process between both views. There we are. Now I will mention, so I've been moving everything around by hand. If you'd rather move things around tabularly, we can do that here. Or we could do it kind of as a, a Kogo operation. And that carries forward for all of these options here, um, whether it's horizontal or vertical. Say so I want to adjust that and move it up half a meter. I'll do that here. So I've changed the number. And there we are. And very close to balancing. So I'm happy with that. Now this surplus and deficit doesn't actually show me how much material I've uh, moved in total or excavated and filled in total. So if I want to see that, I'm going to click this little button here. So that opens up a data table, or we could go new window data. I'm going to configure this data table. So I'm going to tell it how frequently I want to see rows. So let's go every 100 meters. So for that, to set my every 100 meters, I clicked, right clicked in my data table, I clicked data table options, I clicked the little plus next to point types, I've turned on just my auto interval points, and I changed that number to be 100. I'm going to turn on design totals, and then I'm going to tell it what columns I'm reporting here. So I'll change my columns. I want my columns to be, I still want to see the stations that I'm reporting based off of. So I'll leave L station showing. Then I'll come down here and say I want to see cut volume, fill volume, and then I'll see the volumes for my pavement structure. That's those surfacing volumes. We'll hit OK. And there we are. So we can see that we're filling about 17,000 cubic meters and we're cutting about 17,000 cubic meters of our subgrade. And for our surface volume 1, 2, and 3, we can see those volumes here. Before I forget, those surfacing volumes, if I look at my cross section, if I right click in here, I can toggle hatching on and off. I can see that, okay, that sub-base material is being tracked as surface volume 2. Actual asphalt is surface volume 3. Sub-base surface volume 1. Now, we're happy with our quantities. Let's add in a culvert. So I'm not going to add in every culvert for this example. But... I'll say, well, I'll look at my design, look for an obvious spot to add in a pipe. We'll 
let's stay right there where we interface in there. I'm going to click my culvert panel. So that's over here. And if it's not already in your panel, we can click this button to open it up. We'll click add. So there we are. We've added in a 800 mil culvert. If we want to change that culvert size, we can. If we want to change that structure type, we can. If we want to change the length from automatically being calculated, we can change that here. If we want to adjust the skew, we can. So right now that's perpendicular to our road. I'm just going to re-render that. We can see what we're dealing with. If I want to skew that 10 degrees, I'll change my skew. And there we are. My gradient right now is set to be at 5% in the right direction. So that's semi-auto, just means it's going to point it downhill. If I set it to auto, it's going to match my crossfall for me. And we could create a data table, uh, very similar to what we just did for our materials, for all our different culverts, and uh, very quickly here as well. So I'll create another data table. just showing my culvert insertion points. And the only columns that I'm interested in in this case will be station and culvert size. So I want culvert diameter and culvert length. And there we are. And I'm going to just add one in here without any care. But we can see, oops. When I did that, it automatically gets added into that table. So if we are happy with our design, and I am, uh, then I want to plot it. So our document builder is our multi-plot editor. So I've clicked this little icon here. I'll go up to the top here, and I could add in uh, individual subviews, if I'd like, to build this out. So add in my plan, my profile, and build a document entirely from scratch. Uh, if I was starting from scratch and didn't have anything supplied to me, well, I probably wouldn't want to do that. Um, I'd probably want to use an existing document as a starting point. So if I was in the boat, I would change my page size to whatever the document size is that I'd like to produce. And then I'd go over here and I'd grab in an appropriate chapter. So our documents are pages inside chapters inside of a workbook. Now we could take this and we could modify this however we like. Um, or if someone gave us an entire book document, I'll just hit open book layout. And I'll bring in the book file in this data set. So with that, the document's largely set up. We've got our plan over profile. We've got our cross sections. And then we can make a few adjustments if necessary. So in this case, I'm, my alignment's following the geometry of the road, but I've got a little bit of it falling off the edge here. I'm just going to select that sub view. And so I've got my page selected. So this edit's going to happen just at this page level. I'm going to shift this down using the arrow keys on my keyboard. So I'm holding in shift and using the arrow keys on my keyboard to make that move. I could also move it tabularly here. My cross-section geometry, I've got this reported. Uh, I can see station 0, 100, 200. Well, I want to see more cross-sections than that. I'll select my cross-section view, click Layout, go to Point Types, and I'll change this to be whatever I'd like. Or maybe I'll use this other interval. I'll go with 5, and we'll see a very detailed breakdown of how we'd like this geometry to look. So there we are. We've got every five meter intervals and anywhere that we've got a pipe. And that pipe happens to be on a, a five meter interval. But let's go. Let's 
this one is not. And the reason that shows up is because the culvert points is selected. So that's my document. I could either Uh, plot it. So I could just hit print and plot it to a PDF if I wanted a georeferenced document. So I get my plan over profile as a, a georeferenced format with all this other information in it. I could hit save as, change my file type to Avenza. So you could open it up in the Avenza app and have a little icon follow you around showing you where you're at in the design. Uh, or if you wanted a digital format to export to uh, maybe other softwares or to share with your surveyor for construction, we could go file, save as, and we could change this format to a variety of other formats. So we've got the, the common ones in industry. We've got Land XML, which is a great format for sharing with uh, programs such as Civil 3D um, or sharing with your survey crew or sharing with builders that may have GPS machine controls. Uh, if you'd rather just the point data, you can export it as a TXT file. Uh, if you want the line work for either surveying or sharing with CAD, we can go back and forth with either DWG or DXF. So with that, that's kind of a, a quick overview of the, uh, the foundational concepts for how to tackle a, a quick road realignment project in Road Engine. Awesome. Thank you, Matt. So um, with that, uh, just a reminder, you're going to be getting in your email, and this was one of the questions, um, you're going to be getting a certificate of attendance that's going to come from GoToWebinar, uh, as well in an email that's coming from our marketing group within the Softree team, you are going to be getting all of the files that Matt demonstrated here today. So you're going to be getting that RTK data, as well as the LiDAR data, and you can step through this video, which will be up on YouTube, and work on practicing and training with it. Um, so with that, uh, we've got about 15 minutes uh, set aside here for questions. So if you are not sure how to ask one, uh, you just open that little go to webinar panel. You probably need to expand it. It's probably contracted during the presentation. Expand it. There's a little question section there. You can type in any question you would like. Uh, we do keep our question askers anonymous. And with that, Matt, are you ready for questions? I think so. I'll do my best. Okay. Okay. Um, well, let's start with uh, with an easy one. Well, at least, at least I think it looks easy. Um, your LIDAR, LIDAR data set imported quite easily. What happens when the data sets get really big? Does it overload the computer? All right. That's a, a good question. Um, so we have a... We're good at modeling large data sets. Um, so depending on what your background is, you may be pleasantly surprised. You can import an awful lot into ours. Uh, depending on your system that you're running, a, a typical rule of thumb is once you get much over 10 million model points, you start to things start to get sluggish. Uh, so for that, we can thin the data down on import. Now, we don't have to thin down data that's important to you on import. You could put in, say, preliminary alignment. Um, and you can say, well, I want to keep all of my LiDAR resolution within a certain distance of that feature. Uh, but outside of that, I either want to exclude all of my data or uh, dumb down the resolution. Um, yeah, so we absolutely can. And uh, I can uh, send a, a video to anyone that, or the person that asked that question after. After this, I don't have a good data set set up at, at hand to show it. Excellent. Um, the next one, I have a hunch you do not have a data set ready for this one either, but let's give it a try. Um, the question is, how about working with a, an original ground XML file? Do you need to open this in terrain and do something with the file before using it uh, for the design in the location module? Uh, I might have a file. Let's see here. If I, hmm. Nothing like putting Matt on yeah, the spot live even, in a webinar. 
I don't mind answering it at all. I just don't want to spend too much time digging through my poorly organized folders well, here. While you are digging in your poorly organized folders, I'm going to tackle a couple of the questions that seem to be more kind of housekeeping related that have come in. Um, somebody asked, can I get the practice files? Um, yes, absolutely, as well as the presentation slides. So we're happy to share that presentation uh, with anyone who would like it. And we can send that one to you probably separate from the, from the other files. So yeah, uh, be sure to just comment your email in the chat. Um, are you able to issue a certificate of webinar attendance? So I did mention that one. It's coming in a follow-up email that you're going to get from GoToWebinar if you do not see it. Um, please feel free to reply. Uh, you can send a note to news at softree.com and our team can get a, a different certificate generated for you. Um, I think that was it for the housekeeping ones. Are you right. ready, Matt? <laughs> yeah, so I, awesome. I found a, a data set that I can use for it. Uh, Land XML file is a nice file format because it can carry a lot of information with it. Um, so one of the big things, especially with like OG surfaces, is uh, if you're going back and forth between multiple uh, softwares and you want to preserve the triangles of one software to another, uh, Land XML will do that. So if I click Insert File here in Terrain, uh, I can bring that surface into Terrain. I can also bring it right into Location. Um, so let's just show you what I mean. So I'm going to bring in this Land XML topo surface, and it's fairly large. It's based off of a LiDAR data set, if I remember correctly as well. Um, so with that, the Land XML file can have multiple surfaces in it. This one only has one, so the dropdown only shows one. And then I'll hit OK. And I've got this magenta blob once again. And this data was then. So here's an example of that LiDAR question where I've got high resolution data in my area of interest and outside of that, I'm, I don't. Now, if I go to my 3D view, this surface is already created for me. So I don't have to model anything. It's, it's ready to go. Um, so I could just save as train file and reference it. Uh, now, one thing that I will mention if it's a Land XML file based off, say, LiDAR data, each one of these points isn't very valuable. Um, so I can just select those features. I can turn off the display property so I don't see them. And I can hit apply. So again, we've still got our points, but it, they're hidden. It's nice to have context for where you're at, though. So if I come in here and click Terrain Modeling, I don't want to redo the tin surface. I want to preserve that from the original, uh, but I do want my contours. So I'll take that tin that we already have and create the contours from it. And then I could save that as a terrain file. So I'm just going to do that. Now, we didn't have to do that. If we were doing a road design, we don't have to bring that OG topo surface into location. Sometimes it's nice to, though. So if I click New File here, and I define my surface as a Land XML, I can go to the file I'd like to use. So I want to use my topo surface here, the previous one that I had. And I'll hit OK. So what this does, we're still ultimately going to create a terrain surface out of it. We can just skip actually opening up terrain. So here we get that same option, choose the surface we're dealing with. We'll hit OK. And we have to save it as a terrain file to be referenced. Now with this, that file is... Uh, going to be just as we saw when we first opened Terrain. So we're going to get the points. If we want contours, we'll have to generate those contours in Terrain. Um, while we're on the Land XML format type, I'll also just grab a alignment. So that Land XML file can preserve an alignment as well. And I've skipped including the cross-section information with it. But 
there we are. So we've got our surface. If we zoom out here, we can see that there's cross-section information. If we click the 3D view, we can... Oops. Come in here. And for this, if I want to see that, once again, I'll have to set that to display the surface I want. So that's that, whereas if I had of, I can do this after the fact. If I had of used that other surface, so the land XML file that I first brought into terrain and created my contours. And we have more options to kind of control what we see. So in this case, we've turned off all those land XML points, but we can see the contours. So hopefully that answers your question. Um, yeah, and if it doesn't, feel free to follow up um, or um, shoot us a message after after the webinar, and we can go into more detail. Awesome. Lots of questions left, Matt. Let's see yeah. how many we can get through. Um, so the next question is, is it possible to work with two parallel horizontal alignments, each with its own ver different vertical alignment? Yes, it is. Um, so let's see here. Actually, for the sake of simplicity, I, I won't show it because if we've got lots of questions, I'll end up burning up all the all the time just answering things, but uh, we can. So uh, I can think of several instances where you'd like that. Maybe you had a uh, uh, highway with a median in between it with two separate profiles. Uh, maybe you have your road grade and then a ditch grade that, that's different. Um, so we can do that and we can use multiple alignments over here so we can oops, create a new alignment add horizontal alignment if I just wanted to duplicate something I could uh, and then I could reference say, that alignment from that alignment so they tie together so we could have our ditch follow horizontal alignment two and our road follow horizontal alignment one and uh, compute the volumes and the geometry all in that single design. So, I feel like yeah. we could do an entire webinar talking about multiple alignments. Um, so to that question asker, if you do have some follow-ups and specifics, we're happy to go through them with you. Um, you feel free to put your email or your, your more details in the chat and we can follow up. Um, the next question, and this one's long, um, so please, yes, humor me while I attempt to read it out loud. Um, so this question asker is looking to go into the cross-section template to make special special modifications that go beyond the software standards. In the past, they used Eagle Point Road Calc for a long time and could do it in one AutoCAD drawing mode. Um, and then the sort of the follow-up um, to that piece is often the slopes of the typical sections do not intersect the original model terrain and you have to go in section by section to modify. All right, um, so there's, yeah, we can go all sorts of directions with that one. Um, so the the section editor here, or so section view, template editor here, it's meant to be smart. Um, and it's meant to be set up so that we've done all the, heavy lifting and you don't have to worry about getting too much into the uh, the nitty-gritty behavior and building these components from scratch. So when we build these, like I've got my slope that's set to close to our target surface, um, great. It, it works, it just works, it's a, a well-proven component. Uh, things should be good. If we want to change the slope angle for that, we can adjust the cut and fill slopes to be whatever we'd like. But if there was something where, say, I wanted something drastically different from this shape, I'll just copy this, paste as new. 
I could find a template to do what I'd like. Um, so with that, I'll just hit delete and I'll go into slopes and say I want a bench cut slope. I'll copy this, I'll paste that in here. So I paste it in as right. I'll change the geometry to do whatever I'd like it to do. Um, so let's say we've got a bench height of six meters, bench width of three, yada, yada, yada. Everything's, I'm happy with that, but I don't want this applied in fill. So right now, the way I have that set up, I've got bench slopes and fill. So in that situation, we can further control it rather than just geometry. There's just little switches in there where I can take that one and turn that to a zero. And now it doesn't get added in fill, but we could set that to default to our other slope component if that one's not added. Um, and the nice thing about using these components and the smarts in the components is that they they just work. Everything is smart. Things are updating in real time for us. And uh, yeah, we can move our alignment around and it's always going to intersect with the ground and where we'd like it. Um, and these components, the example that I just showed, it's one example. If you want a variable cut slope angle or a variable fill slope angle to tie to another alignment, you can do that. You can use links to reference the reference alignment. Um, yeah, there's all sorts of flexibility built into what we have as kind of a plug and play solution. The uh, more elaborate answer, and it does, it's not simple and 99.9% .9 of our clients don't feel the need to do it. And uh, we've set it up so they don't have to, but you can go in, you can customize components. So click that and you can pull apart and deal with all the logic that's in there um, and still create something that's smart. And then we have our uh, section editor where if you wanted to remove all the smarts and just individually move a cross section to suit a individual location, well, you could do that with the section editor. Um, but yeah, most of the time I'd recommend not using that for a design solution, especially early in your design life, because it takes away the smarts and you'd have to re-update those individual sections um, as you move your alignment around. So hopefully that answers the question. There's all sorts of solutions to that. Uh, in the vast majority of cases, though, by using the template editor, you can have something that's smart and you don't have to reinvent the wheel to have something that's smart. And on that note, um, I'm just going to let all the additional question askers know we are going to be following up with you over email. Uh, it is, yes, unfortunately, the end of our webinar. Um, so first, you know, thank you all for taking the time to step through this training video with us today. Um, we will be sending you the files. You'll get your certificates of attendance. And if you have any other questions, you know, please feel free to reply uh, to the email that gives you your a follow-up email that'll come from our Softree team. Uh, Matt, as always, thank you. Uh, great, great project, great presentation. Um, and have a wonderful rest of your day, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, everyone.